I had to literally step over stuff to get in her house. There was not one place to sit, not one place to eat. She had containers on the corner of the bed because she would eat there because there was not one other surface that wasn't full of stuff. It was just bizarre, like everything was in the wrong place. And so when I got there, like it transcended. It was no longer me going to help somebody get organized. It was me going to help a human in need. I had to help her because she was really in trouble. We emptied the shelves of the medicine cabinet. We put the medicine where it should be. We boxed things up. So when I got ready to leave, she cried and I cried. And I knew that there was so much more to this organizing thing than just moving people's stuff around. It was about people who are feeling desperate, who are in need. And I thought, well, I don't know how to organize, but I can listen. Hey, Poe, how are you doing? Come on, Rod. Good. We're good. How are you? I'm really good. I'm super excited to share this conversation with everyone today uh, with Marsha Sims. You remember our conversation with Marsha. Right, right. Yeah. Organization. That's right. And Poe, I know in your household, you have a very organized household. I would have to say, yes, I do. And that's all due credit to my wife. She's probably between the two of us. She's definitely way more organized than I am. I'm more of the clutter bug. Mm. Yeah, clutter bug. I love that. I've been a clutter bug though my whole life, and it shows. I mean, I, listen, I was probably one of the worst. Um, if you kind of my dorm room in college, like you couldn't see the floor because there was so much stuff <laughs> everywhere. I've gotten better. I've definitely gotten much better. Um, one thing I've noticed is that when the space is clean and organized, we just all feel better. So you probably have like a very calm and kind of serene environment yeah. all the time. Yes. When I'm not cluttering it, my wife is decluttering it. And I just noticed it too. When I go to like my mom's house or something, my mom, my mom's kind of a clutter bug too. So just coming home and seeing how everything has a place and right. you know what I mean? It, it's Feel different, it's right? Different feeling. Yeah, Feel different. sure. Go to a place yeah. that's cluttered. So that's something we're working on in my household. Marsha and I actually met. So Marsha Sims has been a professional organizer for over 30 years. She's written several books on the topic. Uh, and we met actually through my lifestyle medicine care. So she is a patient of mine and Marsha has successfully managed to change her lifestyle behaviors and really take powerful control of her health. And today's conversation, we're really going to focus on her expertise in organization. So Marsha discusses how decluttering physical spaces can really impact our mental well-being. Marsha actually has a background in working with hoarders, and she shares some of those insights as well. And what I love, Poe, is that she offers practical tips and methods, such as her FAST method for approaching and handling paperwork, F-A-S-T. And she has some really interesting insights into minimalism. So as I've gotten to know Marsha better, I've learned about her professional skills and organization, and I've started working with her <laughs> as a professional organizer, and I've definitely been benefiting. I'm someone who's struggled with organization for pretty much my whole life. And so Marsha's guidance has been instrumental in helping me manage my own spaces better. So this episode is useful in terms of the practical organization skills you'll get, but also highlights, I'd say, that very important link between physical health and our environment, which I believe Poe dovetails really nicely with our holistic approach to health and wellness here on The Health Feast. So you might be ending your day, maybe you're going for a walk, maybe you're curling up for bed, wherever you are, get ready to dig in to a wonderful conversation on how we can all become better and more organized. Marsha, hi. It's so amazing to have you here on The Health Feast. I'm really grateful that you could make the time to come on and speak to us today. And Poe, this is Marsha, Marsha, Poe, meet each other. How you doing, Marsha? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I was just, like I was saying earlier, I'm kind of excited to uh, have this conversation with you. I was telling Rock before we got on that 
there's a couple people, including myself, that I'd be that probably be interested in this video, you know, and 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 listening to, and maybe even working with you. Who knows? But I'm just curious about it. What is someone with your expertise, like what have you learned over the years of, you know, what causes this sort of situation? And are there the level of the degrees that people are, you know, disorganized? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited today for this interview. Awesome. Yeah. And it's my intention to answer all of your questions today. My intention. Okay. <laughs> so, Marsha, we usually start by asking our, our guests to reflect on their sort of origin story. That is, how have you come to be in this present day doing what you're doing? And there's probably a whole collection of events and people and circumstances that kind of led to that. So please take us there. How much time do I have for this answer? Because I started out being my own nightmare client. I had three little kids. I couldn't get it together. Kids come with stuff. You know, we think, oh, this precious little being. But the truth is they need everything. They need diapers. They need bottles. They need toys. They need when they're little. And then as they get older, they have clothes. They need books. They need stuff. Where does all that stuff go? And how do you know where to put everything so that everything is in a findable format? And what do you do with all those papers? They come from school that you have to remember to sign and attach $2 to for the field trip and permission. I was completely overwhelmed. When I was young, my mother didn't care. If you didn't clean your room, she'd close the door. She said, you know, just, I don't want to see it. Just leave it in there. So I didn't have those skills. And I vaguely remember in undergraduate school, I had this roommate and she said, it's my room too. And one time she took something and she put it over the desk. And she put all my stuff on my half of the room. I never even noticed that I was a messy. <laughs> I never even paid attention. And then I grew up and got married. And, you know, my husband didn't clean up anything either. So then we brought kids into this mess. And so I wanted to get organized. I had no clue. And I went to my aunt's house and she had this book called Getting Organized by a lady named Stephanie Winston. And I read the book and I thought, wow, I'm not the only one. And that was the genesis of this whole thing. So fast forward, I used to own a real estate company. I was a speech therapist, teach slash teacher, and then I owned a real estate company. And Hurricane Andrew happened here. And when Hurricane Andrew happened in 92, 93, something like that, I had this real estate company, but realtors make really bad jokes. And one joke they used to say is my inventory, meaning all my listings, got blown away. Uh, that's not funny, but that's what they said. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, you know. It's a very off-color yeah. joke. And so what happened was my friend called me, you know, we were in the middle of this transition, like, what am I going to do? I don't have enough listings. I can't sell any houses. We can't, nobody can get insurance. All the insurance companies left. You can't close without, an, without ins homeowner's insurance. It was just a very confusing time. And I live in the North. So all of the, and the hurricane happened in the South part of South Florida. So when FEMA came in, because see Hurricane Andrew was like the first really bad hurricane that hit the United States in the 90s anyway. And so FEMA wasn't prepared. Nobody was prepared. So people from the South were moving up to the North because in the South, the houses really did get ruined. And in the North, you know, we released our listings because we could not gouge. You know, they made it illegal to gouge during a disaster. So brokers couldn't gouge. So I just, I released all my listings and I told my owners, you know, if you can find somebody who's going to rent your house for four times what it's worth, go for it. I can't do that. So it was very tumultuous. So in the middle of all that, I had three sons who had this food habit and I had to find a way to feed them. So what was I going to do? A friend of mine called my real estate office and she said, there's a woman in town from Hawaii. Her name is Mother Kelly, and she's a consultant, and she counsels displaced executives. I called her because I didn't know what else to do. And Mother Kelly, at that time, I remember she charged 
$35 to talk to you for an hour. So I scraped together this $35 because remember, I hadn't had any closings in a couple of months and my kids were needed stuff. I still had the mortgage. Nothing else went away. And so I scraped together this $35 and I went to Mother Kelly. As fast as I could, told Mother Kelly everything that I'd ever done for my entire life. I mean, I told her really fast because I had to get everything in, like all my interests, everything. I told her everything. And then I stopped to breathe. And she just looked at me like she didn't say anything. And I thought to myself at the tender age of, I don't know, 29, 30, she said, I know what you should do. And she started digging through this huge pile on her desk. Her, her desk was so piled up. Though the secretary is sitting behind it, you couldn't even see her. It was like, like put stacks of stuff. And she dug through those stacks and she pulled out the application for the National Association of Professional Organizers. I'd never heard of it. She said, do this and you will be very successful. That's it. So I did it. I joined it. I didn't know anything. So I took a composition book and I wrote down all of my questions. Like, what do you do with all the recipes if you're not going to cook? Or where do you put all the toys? Or how do you know how to file things? How do you know how to find the things that you filed? Because I could file. I mean, I know that alphabet. Duh, I could file. <laughs> but how do you find all that stuff? Like, what do you call it? And what do you do with all the excess? And where do things go? And like all the questions that people ask me now. It's, I really didn't know. You know, it wasn't obvious to me. So I wrote down all my questions in the, this composition book. I had about, I don't know, 40 or 50 questions because, you know, I like to ask questions. And when we'd go in the break rooms, I would pull these organizers to the side. I'd say, what do you do about blah, blah, blah? Or when you have a client who does blah, 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 how do you handle it? Because I pretended like, you know, I was kind of like interviewing them. And they were so nice to me. They answered all my questions and I was taking notes. And I came home ready to just organize my house once and for all again. Because isn't that what we do? We get organized and then it goes right back. Mm -hmm. And then we get organized and then it goes right back. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing that yo-yo. I'd clean it up and then it'd go right back. And I couldn't understand like how come it was always messy and so when I came back, I was so ready, right? I was so ready to organize my stuff. I was going to organize my files and get that part of my life ready. But there was one thing I didn't know. I didn't know that NAPO, National Association of Professional Organizers, I didn't know that they were going to give people my name and my number. So my phone started ringing and people would say, looking to hire a professional organizer, how much do you charge? And I would get them off the phone. I had no intention. I didn't, I didn't know how to organize anything. I had no intention. <laughs> and, and people people kept calling off the phone. But this one lady called and she wouldn't stop calling. And like this was before the day of caller ID. Because had this been during caller ID days, I would have never, ever talked to that lady. And I would have never started my business. So it's good that I started a long time ago. And she would call and she'd say, hi, I want to hire an organizer. And I would find a reason to get her off the phone. And then she, you didn't talk to me last time, but I really need to know, when can you come? She kept calling. So finally, I felt guilty. And I felt like she's going to think it's her. She's going to think that I don't want to go to her house because her house is too messy or whatever. She didn't know the problem was me. I didn't want to go because I didn't have a clue what to do. Mm -hmm. So finally, I felt so guilty because she kept calling. I mean, that I knew it was the same lady. <laughs> and so one day she called me and she wouldn't let me get her off the phone. She wouldn't stop talking. And she was saying, and it's such so bad. And my husband left and my boss is going to fire me. And I'm afraid my landlord's going to kick me out. And she went on and on and on. And the whole time she was talking, I wasn't even listening. You know how like people will talk to you and you're so busy thinking about what you're going to say if they stop talking, but you really don't hear them. Well, I really didn't hear what she said, but I could catch those things. And finally she said, when can you come? And I felt so guilty. I thought, okay, I'll go. 
It'll be terrible. She'll hate it. I won't charge her and I'll never do it again. So that was my attitude. And when I got there, she walked down to the, my car to greet me. She didn't want me to just come to the house because it was so bad. And when she opened the door, literally tears came to my eyes. It was horrible. I had to literally step over stuff to get in her house. There was not one place to sit, not one place to eat. She had like containers on the bed, on the corner of the bed, because she would eat there because there was not one other surface that wasn't full of stuff. She had medicine in the, you know, that cabinet in the bathroom where the medicine cabinet, but she didn't have medicine in there. It was too full. She put medicine in the file cabinet. It was just bizarre. Like everything was in the wrong place. And so when I got there, like it transcended. It was no longer me going to help somebody get organized. It was me going to help a human in need. And I had to help her because she was really in trouble. It was really, really bad. So I cleaned off a place on the chair for me to sit and we cleaned off a place for her to sit. I mean, literally there was not one place to sit. And the table, I cleared off just enough room on the table to put a legal pad. And I took the legal pad with me because it was just an old real estate habit. I always carried a legal pad when I was doing real estate, you know, measurements. and stuff. So I just had it because I had it. And we sat down and she started talking and she just talked and I didn't know what to say. I didn't say anything. So she just kept talking, talking, talking until she just kind of talked it out. So I said, let's get started. She said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know, but we can't leave it like this. This is terrible. But on that day, it was so honest and so real, and it was terrible. So we started doing all the stuff my mother used to tell me to do that I ignored, because I never really paid attention to my mother when she would tell me to clean up. It's like, "Ah." so she would just close my door. But we started with the floor. And I learned so much. I learned things that day that I still use. For example, the floor is the largest visual surface in a room. If all you do is get everything up off the floor, you'll feel better because that's what you really see when you walk in the room, you see floors. You start with the surface, you start with the floor, and then you move up to the next lowest surface. Maybe it's a table, like a living room table, or maybe it's a chair, and then you move up. I learned that organizing is about surfaces. If you don't know what to do, clear off a surface. Start with a small one. Start easy. If you can clear off one surface, then you can clear off one more surface. If you can clear off two surfaces, well, then you can clear off one more surface. So you start small and make incremental progress. We took the medicine out of the oven. Her medicine was in the oven, not the file cabinet. She had shoes in the file cabinet. That's what she did. Because she put the medicine in the oven because she thought she would not lose it. But it's because she never used the oven for for herself because she always brought in fast food because you couldn't cook in there. So it worked out for her, but it was just really not not the way it should be. So we emptied the shelves of the medicine cabinet. We put medicine where it should be. We boxed things up. We, you know, just so when I got ready to leave, she cried and I cried. And I knew that there was so much more to this organizing thing than just moving people's stuff around. It wasn't about that. It was about people who are feeling desperate, who are in need. And I thought, well, I don't know how to organize, but I can listen. Like I'd go to clients who were really in trouble, but they were, they were coping. So maybe you can't walk in your house, but you have a shoe rack by the door and you always put your shoes there. And I think, well, that's a good idea. And I would take that to the next person. And then maybe her house was a disaster, but she had her pots lined up in, on the wall, so from small to big, and they all fit. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. Now I had two ideas. And I would just learn from everybody, and I carried it forward, and I never advertised. I always got referrals because people were so happy. But I brought some skills that I never thought about. For example, I don't judge anybody. I really don't. I never have. I don't see the need for that. Like, I don't need to judge you. You're trying to be okay in life. I'm trying to be okay in life. If we can't get along, just leave me alone. But I don't need to judge you. So if you would bring me in your house, I would be the best whatever you need for the day. For example, 
You may need a, somebody, a secretary type of person to help you go through your papers. I would be the best secretary for you for today. You might need somebody to just listen to you today. I would be the best listener for you today. So I would figure out what was needed and I would be that for that person for the day. And people loved me. And so they kept wanting to give me their stuff. And in the early days, I would bring it home. (laughs) (laughs) It's not smart. So then I had to learn how to not bring things home. And then I got to the point where we, we would take things to Goodwill for people and give them the receipt. I didn't need any more stuff. You know, I had too much stuff on my own. And I remember the day I was at somebody's house and I thought to myself, and I don't even know how many years this had been, like two or three, four years, I don't know. And I thought to myself, wow, this stuff is really working. You need to look at it and backtrack it to see what you are doing right so you can do it for yourself. <laughs> you know? And you can have a structure that will help other people. And so that's what I started doing. I started paying attention to things I automatically did and didn't even pay attention to. For example, when I walk into somebody's house, I would notice something positive and I would say, oh, that's a beautiful painting. Oh, I really like the color in that room. Oh, look at those stones at your entryway. That's a really nice idea. Or I love the arch, you know, archway, but that's me. I just do that. It wasn't a tactic. But when I looked at what I'm doing, I said, wow, look what I do every time. I make people feel comfortable. I establish rapport. I ask about them because I really care and I really want to know. It's not a tactic. I do want to know. And I was kind of curious, like, how did you get in this mess? Because I'm in a mess too, but they just didn't know it. I've had people say, oh, Marcia, you can't possibly understand why I saved every toilet paper roll I've ever seen. It's like, yeah, I can, because I think I'm an artist too. (laughs) But (laughs) But I didn't tell them that. You know, I would just say, well, you know, I understand. Can I just say, first of all, so much of what you said, like, resonates with me because I was very messy as a child. Parents were very organized and mom, dad would close my door, but also just kind of get upset at me about that. I was that guy in college that my roommate was like, another person lives here too. (laughs) I mean, I'm embarrassed now when I think back to how... I lived, but I didn't stop after med school and take me to present day. (laughs) Like it's something I'm working on. That's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. And we can talk about that later. Like I wanted to, my experience working with you and and, and doing this and how you work with clients now. But I just wanted to say that I'm so amazed that someone like that is then now become like the grandmother of organizing And then also one thing that you said that just really, really resonated with me was that even from the hoarder, you know, the most pathologic hoarder, you could learn something that you took lessons from people. And most people, they go into a situation and they say, I have everything to teach and give this person. And the fact that you went in, in, like you said, with no judgment, that who am I to judge? And then you not even didn't judge, but you actually... You, you took lessons from them and brought them to others. It's really incredible. Thank you. I heard this one time. I went to a presentation and the guy said something like, we're all angels, but we only have one wing and we have to join together in order to fly. So, something like that. And I thought that was so beautiful. And I thought, yeah, I can live my life like that. Like, yeah, I'm trying to be good. I have one wing, but I can't help you without you. I can't know more about your life than you know about your life. We have to look out for each other. I mean, we're all on this planet together, whether we like to think that or not. So I just try to live that way. The other thing I got was I used to watch um, Robert Shula. He was a minister at some temple in California. And like, I'm not religious or anything like that, but he had this cup, this mug that he was giving away for free. And on it, it said, Show me the person you want to speak to through my life today. And I thought, I can adopt that. Who can I help today? What do you need? Can I do it? I mean, I'm not going to go out of my way to, you know, feed five families, but you may just need a smile today. You just may need somebody to pick up the extra $3 of your groceries because you ran out of money. 
There are things I can do. There are things we can all do. So do that. You don't have to do everything, but you can do something. So do something. So I figured out that I have the ability to make other people figure out what they need to organize. Because I can't walk in your house and know what you need. That makes no sense. But a lot of organizers do. And when I train organizers, I try to tell them, our profession is about listening, not knowing everything. You don't know everything. I don't know if you're right-handed or left-handed. I don't know where you should keep your files. I don't know where you want to keep your files. I don't know how many files you want to keep, but I can know how to ask you. So I ask. And if I ask you the question right, you will answer it. And you know the answer. You just don't know how to get there. Once I know what you want, I can help you get there. So my questions are always things like, what bothers you the most? If everything were perfect, how would it be? Where do you want to start? Like, I would say, yeah, based on what bothers you the most or what would make you feel the best if it were done. So the way I work with people is to ask questions. And to the degree that they know the answers, I can help them get there. We have to work together. This is, I can't work for you. I can work with you. And people used to say, oh, if you could just do this for me, I want to go on vacation and come back in my house with me. <laughs> and that's a great idea, but then you're going to discover what about my blah, blah, blah that you threw away? Well, I didn't yeah, know. It was exactly, yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, I had a big lesson. I was working with an editor, and she had this ratty, torn up, beat up note. It looked like the back of a clipboard with nothing on it. It was just raggedy. So I said, thinking this is obviously garbage, right? I said, tell me about this. And she said, oh, that's the notebook that I used to write stories in and I'd read them to my grandmother. And the reason I'm an editor today is because I used to write stories in that notebook. So I said, well, you can't throw that away. We have to figure out where it's going to go. But if left to my own devices, not knowing anything, I would have thought this is obviously garbage. I mean, it looked like garbage to me, but it wasn't for me to know. So as an organizer, you cannot organize without the person being there. That's good to know, because over the years, what have you learned about dealing with people like, you know, obviously I haven't watched the, the show, but I know there's a show about it on regular TV, right? And I'm wondering, like, how much of hoarding is something that's emotional and how much of it is just people not like laziness? Like if I were to say myself, right? Right. I think for me. I can't say that I'm the best organizer. I like to clean up after myself, stuff like that. My wife is like an incredible organizer. Like our house is always spotless, like to the point where it's like- You're very lucky. Very lucky. Cause I don't, I don't think I could, I could keep it up the way that she does, right? But I'm also wondering about this, this idea that like, cause I know, you know, some people they're really emotionally attacked like that notebook, but like there's, you know, 20 of them. Like they're, they're, there's like 20 things that they're attached to or, you know, why do we need, you know, five of the same, whatever that is. And then, so like, for example, I'm just, I'm just going to say my mom, she works a lot. So it's hard for her to get to, she always says, oh, on this next vacation or this next weekend, I'm going to clean my house. Barely. And if she does that same desk, that surface, like the desk that's in the, the, the living area, she'll stack it back up in a week or two. So can you talk about that? Like, so the first question is how much of it is like emotional and how much of it is just, they're just not motivated or is it one in the same, you know, the emotional attaches to, I'm not going to say laziness, but like the motivation to get it done. Have you seen that? Okay. That is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that question right up front. That's an excellent one. You're asking three or four questions all together. And it sounds like one question, but really it's not. And here, here's what I mean. There's a big, huge difference between hoarding and being messy. It's like the difference between being an alcoholic and having too many drinks one night. A hoarder, a real true hoarder is emotionally attached and cannot throw things away, even if they're garbage. So you see here about hoarders collecting all kinds of things, but things that make no sense and trash, cans, you know, things that make no sense at all, which is different from somebody who has way too much and is just collecting too much and is messy. It's a big difference. For the person who is truly a hoarder, they need help. Maybe working in a program like my program, where because I really help people take the slow route to getting it 
organized and doing things one at a time and making a plan and sticking to the plan and things like that. So I do work with, I have worked with quite a few hoarders in my career. The problem with hoarders though, is often they can't get all the way to the finish line because it takes a long time and it can get to be extremely expensive, which is one of the reasons I created my program. For people who are just messy, who just have too much, then you have to say, well, is this a stuff problem or is it a time management problem? And sometimes they can look different. For example, you can have too much stuff. And so you're always trying to get, find things on your way out so you're late. Or you can have poor time management skills and you never get around to cleaning up. So that's still more than one issue. And for me, I like to narrow down the issue so we can fix it because you can't solve a problem looking at the flower or the trees. You got to have to go to the roots. So I like to figure out what's the real problem, what's the real goal, because I'm very goal oriented with my clients. I need to know what do you want to accomplish with me today, and then see we can narrow it way down to that, right? We know we have 90 minutes. What are we going to have done at the end of 90 minutes? And then I give you tips to maintain it. Part of the problem that your mom is having is I used to describe it when I was out speaking, I would describe it like, okay, so you have a stack of papers that you want to go through your desk. For example, you take all the papers, you say, oh, okay, okay, this, I don't need this. I'll throw this in the trash. This, oh, I've been looking for this. So I'll put it right here. You go through a few more papers and you say, oh, I've been meaning to respond to this. I'll put it right here. Oh, I have to pay this. I'll put it right here. And so you go all the way around in a circle with all the things that are important that you just dug up. Now your time's up. You have to go. And so what do you do? You put it all back in a pile. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. <laughs> so it can take like years to clean off a, a desk. <laughs> because you don't have a final resting place for anything because you're thinking about it from the perspective of the desk and not the perspective of where do things need to live. So what I tell people is, okay, let's talk about the kinds of papers you're going to have. You're going to have papers that you need to file. You have papers that require action. You have papers that need to be shredded and your papers that need to go in the trash, F-A-S-T. So now when you start going through papers, you put them in four categories. Are you going to file this? Does it require you to do something? Do you need to pay it, respond to it, write about it? Are you going to shred it or do you just, can you just dump it? That way, when you finish your 90 minutes, you put the tops on those boxes. And then when we go back to it, you handle them by category. And that helps you get your desk cleaned off. And then you have your categories. When you're dealing with papers that are going to be filed, you need a system, hence filing system, right? So when you pick up this piece of paper, this is an insurance policy. Where do your insurance policies live? Oh, it goes in this folder. See, so you have a place for it to go because other than that, it has to go back in the pile. Action, you're gonna make a phone call about it. And I tell people to put it in a folder. Don't put it in a folder called people to call because you will never go in that folder because it's going to be too fat and you don't want to do it anyway. Because if you wanted to call those people, you would have called them. So don't do that. Make an individual folder that says call blank, blank, blank about the blank, blank, blank. Okay. So you put all your things that you need to do in folders. And then what I tell people is just look at it every day. You don't have to do anything you have to look at it. So just look at it and you'll say, okay, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do, oh, I don't mind. I'll do this today. And that way you can get your action files smaller. Things that may need to be shredded. You need to set aside a time to shred. Maybe you have a favorite program that comes on TV on, I don't know, Thursdays at 630. So Thursdays at 630, while you're going to be seated anyway, let that be your also shredding time and start getting that shredding done or hire a kid. Kids love to shred. <laughs> you know, they yeah, do. They, yeah. they, kids love that. <laughs> Hire a kid, five bucks an hour, maybe maybe 10 if you're generous, and you know, you're shredding done. 
and things that are just trash, like flyers that everybody gets. Let's put them in the trash. So that way you have a methodology to go through things. That's for papers. But then there are three-dimensional things that are not papers. Clearly, they're three-dimensional. This is not rocket science. It's just <laughs> a methodology. So when I tell people, if you walk into a room that's piled up to forever, right, and you're scared to approach it, how do you start? I like to make everything simple. So the first thing you do is you divide it up into everything made out of fabric or cloth. Take it out first because that just gets in the way. It just gums up the works. Everything made from papers outside of books, but like magazines, mail, newspaper, whatever papers, box them up, label it papers from the blank, blank, blank room and the date and just make a nice stack of boxes because you're going to go through them eventually, but at least they won't be like this. They'll just be contained. And then you go through your three dimensional things, three dimensional things. You just say yes, no, or maybe. Yes, I want it, and I know where it goes. Put it there. No, I know I don't want it. I meant to get rid of it years ago. It's leaving. Put it in an area for charity, in your trunk, by the door, in a box labeled charity. And then there are your maybe items. Maybe means I don't know if I want it or not. I'm not sure. Or I want it, but I have no idea where it goes. And so you divide things up because when you divide, you can conquer. So then all your charity stuff goes to charity. That's easy. Get a receipt, you're good. All your, yes, I want it, put them where they belong. And then the maybes, you go through again with yes, no, and maybe. And the amazing thing is every time you go through yes, no, and maybe, you will have made more decisions you don't even know that you're making. You make them subconsciously. You know, do I really need that green vase that I got 40 years ago from my great aunt who doesn't care about it? I think I can let that go. And you're not even thinking about it. And you look at it and you can say, I have no idea why I kept that. Why do I want like that? Or sometimes we keep things for bad reasons. Like I had a bread maker that I had never used. I won it at some raffle and I never used it. And my son had this girlfriend. She asked me, could she use the bread maker? I'm trying to be nice. I said, yes. She used my bread maker and lost the instructions. I saved it for almost 20 years because I was mad at her. And every time I looked at the bread maker, it reminded me that I was mad at her. Now that sounds silly and yeah, I can laugh about it now, but the truth is we save things for all kinds of reasons that make no sense. There's also something called clutter blindness where we just don't see it. So I'll give you an example. Nothing in my house is blue. My house is cream colored. The walls are cream, like a egg, eggshell cream colored. My accents are maroon and teal. Nothing is bright blue in my house. So one day I walked in the house with my three sons from school and there was this blue box sitting in the middle of the living room floor. I said, what is this box doing? Because nothing's blue in my living room. So we don't know what, what it was. We don't know how long it had been there. We just stepped over it. For how long? We don't know. Anyway, once I noticed it, we went through it, threw everything out, and the box was gone. But we don't know because we overlooked it. For how long? I don't know, days, weeks? Could have been years. We didn't, we didn't know. And so that's another reason people keep things, because they're just so busy doing their life. They're not. It's kind of like white noise. The equivalent of white noise for your sound is like you have all this stuff, but you've just sort of blocked it out because it doesn't have any bearing on any priority in your life. So you're like, I don't even pay attention. And we don't. And we don't. Like junk mail, same thing. I had a client with 50 boxes of papers to go through. 50. Oh, man. Uh, and banker's boxes. That's a lot of papers that she never looked at. She'd get them and throw them in the box. Get it, throw it in the box. So I said, well, you know, the good thing is probably most of it's obsolete. And the good thing about bills is if you don't pay them, they'll send you a reminder next month. <laughs> you, don't have, <laughs> you don't have to worry about those. But, you know, if something's important, you kind of may want to know. But anyway, those questions were good. So I don't think it's a question of being lazy. I think it's a question of not having systems that support you. 
And you have to make it easier to be organized than it is to be disorganized. So if, if you walk into your house and you don't feel like, I don't know, hanging up your coat or whatever people do, where it's called, where I live, we don't have to worry about coats. So let me say sweater. <laughs> you don't feel like it, you just take it off and throw it on the, the chair. And then every three months you have to hang up all those sweaters because you need a sweater now. Well, you just have to have it so that it's simple for you. Maybe you put up a hooks, you know, a thing of hooks. Maybe you'll have a hanger right there. So when you come in, there's a hanger there. You have to create a system to make your life easier. Because other than that, you're putting work into the future. And, you know, we, we go into the future as if there's not stuff there, but we drag all this stuff from the past into the present. And then we drag it into the future. So our future's already full. You know, I'm going to do all this stuff Friday. No, I'm not. Because Friday is going to show up and you know what? I'm going to do exactly what I'm doing right now. And it's not that. So I have this fantastic class that you're supposed to come to my class and work on your organizing project. And I tell my students every week, when you come to my class, work on the things that are hard for you to do. Don't do easy stuff in my class. That's a waste of money. Do hard stuff. I will help you right? Because if you are stuck, I'm the best person in the world to help get people unstuck. I'm just good at it. And I'll tell you what I do in a second. But, And I have people who come to class and every Friday they say, I'm going to wash the dishes today because I didn't get around to it all week. Every Friday. So you know what that means? They're not getting around to any of the other stuff either because every Friday they'll wash dishes. Now, at least they wash dishes once a week when they're in my class. Po, I attended her class a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you. First of all, can I, before you tell us more about it, I just want to say how, what an innovative idea. So this, Po, and for our listeners, this is a Zoom call, like a group class for organizing. And it's it's not just a class. So, Marsha, how does it, like, everyone comes on, and there were like seven, eight people on, six, seven people, and you start off by basically saying like what you're going to do in the next 20 minute block. So she breaks it up in 20 minute blocks. And so much of that, because I run groups for lifestyle, right? And you know, you're a part of my lifestyle groups, right? And so I see so much overlap, not just in these groups, but just in general, what you're doing, like, what is it? It's there's accountability, right? So I'm doing it with other people or I, Marcia, you're serving to help with their accountability. There's guidance, right? So I'm not doing it just to clean up and then have it happen again. Like I'm figuring out a system. And these are the same things <laughs> that I talk about with my patients with changing their diet. And so it's so fascinating to me. And you also serve as a coach in that way. As you're describing your role, I'm sort of thinking like, Marsha, you're an organizing coach. Like you're you're deeply listening and you're helping them figure out the capacity they have within to be their own self-organized self. That's pretty fascinating. As you were telling your story, I was just thinking of how much of this, you know, yeah, we're talking about organization, but it can also apply to, to other things. And then now that, you know, Rock is talking about how there's a lot of correlation between lifestyle and, you know, his expertise and his experience in lifestyle medicine and then you and your experience of you know organizing and it's all kind of it's all kind of one it's all the same thing right 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 it all applies to one. it's all relevant to one another yeah take us through this virtual organization class and how long have you been doing this for it is such an interesting unique concept i've never heard of anyone doing anything like that okay so i used to teach online classes i used to do them I, every year i'd have two or three different topics that I do. I had a, oh, all kinds of different topics, organizing your closet, all kinds of topics. But I had, was doing a fast filing class, F-A-S-T, file, X, shred, toss. Okay, fast filing class for filing your papers. And I had broken it down to, if you would just do like 20 minutes a day of homework, by the end of class, you will have filed I don't know, 180 papers. I, I don't know. I had the numbers all written down. That was my marketing. So I did a class, 12 weeks. Everybody would come to class. And I would teach them something else about papers. And they were supposed to do that particular thing every day. 
when class was almost over, only one person out of like 23 people had done their homework every week. Most of them never did their homework. So when the class was getting ready to end, I said, okay, look, I know you don't have your filing done because nobody did their homework. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a class that I'm going to call a, an accountability class. I think that's what I first called it. I said, I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm not going to raise the price. You just keep paying what you've been paying. Come to class once a week and just work for 90 minutes. That's all you have to do. Just come to class and every week just do what you're supposed to do. And then in X number of weeks, all your filing will be done. I thought that was a great idea. And that's how I got started. A few of them and not that many of them. Maybe, I don't know, maybe in the beginning it was my 15 or 16, about half of the people signed up and then slowly they dropped off. And then other people would say, well, can I be in your class? I don't have to do papers, but I need to do my pantry. Can I come to your class and do my pantry? And at first I said, no. And then I thought, well, that's dumb because the filing people are dropping off. Why not? I mean, it's the same thing, right? They're just doing, and somebody else said, well, can I do my garage? Can I do my this? Can I do my that? So we started doing it. So we call it a boot camp now because not just it's such a brilliant idea because people will a lot of time to go to the gym, a lot of time to go for, you know, some type of whatever a meeting. But then this is time that they're dedicating to organizing their their you know cabinets or their files. And it's now a dedicated time for them to do it versus in your old classes and then they won't they don't make the time for it outside of your Zoom or your class or your, or I guess now be considered a boot camp. That's right. And so the, the class has grown in scope in that now we have a messaging group. So the people who are interested, because some of them wanted to know, can I have a buddy? And I have had experience with buddying people up and it's just a lot of work. I don't like my buddy anymore. Can I get a new one? Who, you know? And so I said, okay, I'm not, I want to do all best, too much work. So I said, okay. So we have this online chat group and all day long, I'm getting ready to work in my garage. Yay, Mary, good job. This is a picture. Look what I did. I got my pantry shelf empty. Yay, congratulate. And it's so supportive. Yeah. I, you know, it's like, but all I really did was listen to what they said they needed. I didn't really make it up. I mean, I guess I kind of made up the first part, but they keep enhancing it. Yeah, so we, we do this thing on, on Messenger. So anybody who wants to participate, as long as they're in the class, they can participate through messages. So I'm going to focus on that more in terms of people being able to stay connected, because I think that's a very important, now that they do it, I mean, all day long, I just went in the garage. It was hard for me to do, but now I'm in here and somebody else says, you know, that's great. You know, you're going to do great. And, and then at the end, they post their pictures and they cheer for each other. It's very it's like a community, yeah. It's like a community. Yeah. A community of people that are all, you know, organizing their lives, so to speak. And one of the reasons it's so boring is because when you're organizing, you're going backwards. You know, we want to go forward in life. You know, I want to go outside. I want to do stuff. I want to go to a play. I want to have a life. But organizing, you have to turn around and go backwards and handle all this stuff you didn't want to handle before. So we don't want to do that. So people don't do it. That's a great like kind of point to make is that I never thought of it in that way too, that it really is sort of a lonely thing because you're kind of cleaning, right? Like you associate organizing with sort of cleaning too. Organizing is about making decisions. As a matter of fact, one of the best phrases I ever heard about, about organizing is clutter is postponed decisions. And I could see that too, you know, when I think of myself, my wife and friends and family, it's like, we go to our jobs eight hours a day, sometimes longer for some folks out there and they're making decisions all day. And then when they get home, what's the last thing you want to do is I, I know for me, what's for dinner. I, you know, I'm asking my wife and my wife asked me, I'm like, man, I don't even know. Like I, right now I just want to relax, you know, cause I've been all day. I've been making decisions. Decision fatigue. This is why like a lot of. Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg, for example, they wear the same like t-shirt and jeans or t-shirt and pants every day. Right. They don't have to make those decisions. So they save decisions for kind of bigger decisions. Point. Yeah. Cause yeah. we have a limited capacity to make decisions. Yeah. So I got a question that I was just talking to rock about was 
could you talk about how our external environment reflects our internal state? In your experience, how have you seen that? I mean, we're kind of talking about it right now, you know, because if internally you're making decisions, you know, throughout the day, you know, driving, you know, I mean, even stuff as little okay. as that. So when I was really young, I came up with this idea that everything we see is not real. That what's real is what we don't see. What we think about is real. Our ideas are real. All this stuff out here is just stuff. I think it came when I heard this, this lecture about this, there was a chair on the stage and this guy said, what is it? And people said, it's a chair. He said, yeah, but before it was a chair, what was it? Well, okay. It was wood and it was, you know, cotton, but before, what was it? It was an idea because the idea is what's real. The chair is just a, you know, manifestation of what we thought about. All that clutter comes from in here. Idea, it's right. like we didn't make the decisions. If you have a decision about where things belong, then they won't be all over your house. They're there because you haven't made those decisions yet. Mm. From here. Do you want this or do you not want it? That's in here. How many of these do you need? That's in here. See, everything comes from in here. And then it shows up in our world physically in three dimensions. But it just shows up that way. Not where it is. Where it is, is in here. How many glasses do I want? I don't know. Every week when I go shopping, I buy another box with six, six glasses in it. So now I have 400 glasses and won't fit in my cabinet. Well, that's not the, the glasses didn't create that problem. You did. See, I had a client one time. She loved hats. She had a lot of money. Her family was very wealthy and she had so much. She had so many hats you couldn't couldn't get in the house and walk around and sit down anywhere without seeing, sitting on, having to move a hat. She loved them. And so I said, well, why do you have so many hats? Because I like to ask questions that are obvious. I mean, I needed to know, right? <laughs> she said, because I can't decide which ones are the best ones. Yeah. That was the problem about the hats. She couldn't decide. It's a decision problem. So every time you see stuff everywhere, it's either a time problem, a decision problem, an organization, meaning where do things belong problem. When people call me and they have no idea where to start, like everything is everywhere. My house is a mess. My life is a mess. I don't know what to do. How do I start? Well, the first thing you start is by thinking. If everything were perfect, how would it be? Well, I could walk in and you know, I wouldn't be embarrassed to open the door, blah, 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 thinking. But then the next thing we do, I have people do, is to draw a schematic of their living space. And, and not anything complicated. You can draw a schematic in a minute. You just draw a rec A house is basically a rectangle with a bunch of rectangles in it. Sometimes you have two stories of rectangles, but it's still rectangles. And then you decide, okay, here's the living room. Here's the family room. Here's the kitchen. Here's the th blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. If everything were perfect, what kinds of items would you have in your living room? Well, you may say, well, I'll have an area for people to sit. I'll have my music because company may come over. I'll have, a, you know, stuff like that, some, some whatever, whatever you have. Okay, what belongs in the family room? Well, the kids' toys, the TV, the, I don't know, DVD player, whatever you have, kids' game things. Okay, bedroom, what belongs in the bedroom? Well, my clothes, my shoes, my linen. So once you make a decision about where things ultimately belong in your home, based on just drawing a schematic and thinking about it, now when shoes come in the house, you know where they go because you already made a decision. When sweaters come in the house, you know where they go because you already made a decision. When paper comes in the house, you already know where it goes, see? So you don't have to think about everything. You've pre-thought a lot of the decisions. So what you see when you see this is a whole bunch of decisions that never got made about how I want to handle this, where this ultimately belongs, what I want to do about it. Having a mess creates stress because we're thinking about what we see. And so to the degree or to the, that, that you have things yeah. not laying around on tables and surfaces, you feel more serene, even if all you do is put them in boxes and put the boxes in the corner. If that's all you do, you'll feel better.
But see, it's about how you feel. It's not about what's real. That's also in here. So it's all in here. That's been a big shift, actually, for me. Like, this is why I'm like so eager to pursue better organization in my life and for our family and our household because I've recognized that. That's why I wanted to have you on, actually, because we call this show The Health Feast. The idea being that, like, people think of good health often as a chore or punishment. And we know it actually is an opportunity to feel good. It's actually an opportunity to feel good. And just in that same way, being organized, having a place for everything, it makes your life, it makes your household just flow better. Everybody's in a better mood. I know this because we go through the cycles of like, let's do a lot of cleaning, let's and then it sort of, and when we do that, and then like for the day and a half that it sort of lasts, <laughs> or maybe six hours, whatever, then we're we're like, whoa, this feels great. Like, you know, or sometimes my kids will go stay with my in-laws for the weekend, like the house will just, and there won't be that many dishes <laughs> and things. And, and we're just sort of like, this is great. Like, what if it could be like this all the time? And so I have that pursuit and it just really to feel good, not because you should be organized, not because it's good for right. you, not, yeah. Right. right. It's not a moral issue. It's a feel good issue. You know, in our society, we've turned it into a moral issue, but it's, and then there's this whole thing about left brain thinkers and right brain thinkers and left brain people in theory, you know, are in a straight line and right brain people are kind of like that, right? Which is why you basically cannot organize for somebody else. They have to be involved. The other thing is organizing is about surfaces. You know, just break it down to what it is. Like when you go into a hotel, for example, you leave your house, you go on a vacation, go in a hotel. It feels so serene. Why? Because there's nothing on any surfaces. All the surfaces are cleared off. Well, you can do that in your house. Even if you don't make all, even if you don't do anything I'm suggesting, and all you do is clear off each surface one at a time, put that stuff in boxes, label it from the, you know, credenza, from the living room, and just move it. When you walk in, you will feel that same feeling that you get in a hotel. If you look at magazines, like those beautiful house magazines, you know, House Beautiful, this and this and this, at the grocery store line, in the impulse rack. What you'll notice, what is conspicuously missing in all those pictures of homes that are beautiful is stuff. There's not like, what do they read? Where's their mail? Where are their shoes? Where are this? You know? <laughs> None of that stuff is visible. It's like in the bedroom, like <laughs> you open the closet. <laughs> That's right. Well, if you just need to feel good for the moment, Clear off your surfaces and you'll feel excellent. And that won't solve the ultimate problem because you still have to decide where do where do your things go and how many do you need. But the other problem is the first world problem of we just have way too much. We just do. We don't need all that stuff. I remember I read an article about people traveling in Europe and how Americans have like, you know, six bags they're carrying off on the airport. And, you know, Europe the European kids, you know, they have a backpack. Like, we don't need all that stuff. I'm getting ready to go to Kenya. My son and I, are we're testing to see, can we actually go to Kenya for two weeks with a carry-on? I'm going to test it. I'm going to test it and see if it's possible. It's interesting because there's like a big movement in being a minimalist. You know, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I know within the last 10 years, I think, it's become more cool to have, to to like, uh, we call them uh, tiny homes. I think it's a beautiful idea. I am not, personally, on a personal level, I do not want to be a minimalist because I love books. I love, I love my stuff, but I've learned to control it. Hmm. So like, I like to do jigsaw puzzles. As a matter of fact, jigsaw puzzles remind me of my work. And so for Christmas and holidays, birthdays, everybody gives me jigsaw puzzles. And I have a sister who volunteers at a thrift store. So for Christmas, I might get 15 puzzles. And I used to keep them, but I'm not going to do 15 puzzles. I'm only going to do the ones I like. So now I re-gift them. I usually send them back to another thrift store or I give them away because I don't need everything anymore. I need less and less and less. Mm. 
I like to make my own food. I have a lot of cooking equipment. You know, I know somebody who was a raw foodist who only had a knife. I can't do that. Yeah, it was very impressive. I thought it was impressive. I can't do that. I need a food processor. I need a Vitamix. I need a this. I need a that. You know, a mandolin. I have all that stuff. So for me, I'm not interested yeah. in being a minimalist because I want my things that I want. But I don't need, you know, four computer lap. I don't need four laptops. You know, I only need the things that I need that I use. And I think that moving towards minimalism is a good idea. And I encourage people to watch the minimalism YouTube videos that make you feel good. There are some that you'll watch that'll make you feel so good. You feel like I can do this. Mm. There's one that I watch every time I watch this guy, I see things I don't care about anymore. I'll walk through my house and I'll say, I don't need that. I'll get rid of it. And I never really looked at it or thought about it, but then there are some that I watch that I think, oh, that's too much work. I don't want to do all that. You have to really go by how you feel about it. I would never want to live in a tiny house because I have too much kitchen equipment. <laughs> right, right, right. It won't fit. You know, but I'm not a closed person. <laughs> if you're a closed person, you, you know, then, then adapt for that. If you're a kitchen gadget person, adapt for that. But make your house, make your life feel good because that's what we're trying to do is feel good. And the other thing is, you know, in our society, we make rules for everything. You know, it's supposed to be like this. No, it should be like this. No, you should have this many. You should have this. That's not true. There are no rules. Everybody makes up their rules. So make up your rules. How many do you need? And that's a big question that I ask people. How many of these do you need? Pick a number. You can always change it, but you need a guide. Make a decision. Make a decision. That's right. And and to your point, you need a guide. Yeah. You need somebody who's yeah. there who's saying, like, I'm going to hold you accountable to making this decision right now. I think it's helpful. Yeah, not everyone needs that, for sure. I think guidance and just sometimes people just need that, like the, I, the semblance of a system and the, what they're working towards. I love that you frame, you start the conversation and you did this with me when we started working together on organization, which was like, what is your sort of goal state? Like, how would things look if they were perfect? And I remember thinking, like, I would love it if I knew where everything was. And I would love it if something was out and I knew exactly where it should go, right. like, to be put back. And as a result of that, make the space free of clutter. And if it was not effortless, but seemingly easy, like, didn't feel like a momentous chore like cleaning up feels like now. I really like how you talk about you're very simple and how you make the, your process simple. Cause I was going to ask you like, what would be a message for our listeners? And I'm listening as well, like just to get, to get started, because I know having a guide is always great because it's always nice to ask somebody like, what do you think about this? And then, you know, obviously through your expertise and your experience, you can give, right. but I love how you used fast. Like, I just never thought about that. If you wanted to like talk to our listeners about if you're in this situation that you want to get, you know, start to declutter your life, kind of, you know, get organized, you know, what's a simple way, you know, how to just get started. You know, when people call me up and they say, well, I can't, but I can't, you can do this. People who are not as creative, not as smart, not as nice as you have figured it out. So it's not impossible. So the first thing you need to do is to realize that it's doable. You don't have to live in a messy house. It's almost a choice. So the first thing you want to do is you want to think about what's wrong because we're good at coming up with what's wrong with stuff. So what's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it is I have stuff all over the floor and stuff on the table, stuff on the chairs. Can't find what I need when I need it. Blah, blah, blah. What's wrong with it? Write it down. And then from that, let's figure out how you want it. I want my floors cleaned off. Okay. I want my chairs cleaned off. Okay. I want my table cleaned off. Okay. So you figure that out and I think it's easier to figure out what you want from what's wrong. Or I don't know, maybe I'm just negative. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's just me. But I, I, have found, I have found that people can always find something wrong with something. And then from that, you start to make a plan. Here's what you should not do. You should not just say, oh, okay, 
It's Friday. I have the rest of the weekend to get started and I'm going to organize. And then you just start moving stuff around. That never lasts because you don't have a plan for how you're going to do it, where things are going to live. Mm. So, so then you make your plan. And I think the easiest way to make a plan is with a schematic. Where does it belong, right? If you belong in this room, put it in this room. I like the idea of boxing it up. One of our books called Five Days to a Clutter-Free House says, box everything. So you're in, the, you're in a big, messy room. So you can get a box. So you find something that belongs in the bedroom. Don't go run to the bedroom. Put it in a box labeled bedroom. So when it fills up, then you make a few trips so you don't get distracted. Because the other thing we do is we'll start cleaning the table and we'll say, ah, oh, this goes in the kitchen. So you go in the kitchen and you get in the kitchen and say, oh, I really need to wash the dishes. So you start washing the dishes and then the phone rings. So you leave the kitchen and you go in the room where you're going to talk on the phone and you see three things that you need to handle. One goes in the laundry room. So you go in the laundry room and you say, you know, I really need to wipe the washing machine. I haven't done that in four months. So then, but I need a towel. So you go to get the towel and then you're in another room and you never get anything done. So stay in the room, get boxes. I recommend banker's boxes because they're all the same size and they can stack neatly against a wall. And then you just start putting things in the room where they belong that you've already pre-decided. And then you carry things to the room. You carry the bedroom boxes to the bedroom. You carry the family room boxes to the family room. You carry the kitchen boxes to the kitchen. That room, the original room, is cleared up. Then you move to the next room and the next room and the next room. So you do them in order like that. So yes, you may have to live with boxes in your bedroom for a couple of weeks. You may have to live with boxes in the kitchen for a couple of weeks. That's okay because you'll have one perfect room. And always start at the room that you would feel the best in if it were done. Always start. Because then you have what I call your area of sanity. Because once that's cleaned up, always have a nice cleaned up place to go to. And the minute you find the wrong thing in there, move it immediately. So I'll tell you this little story. When I first decided to be an organizer, my car was full of everything. Because I had three kids and we had wrappers and papers from school and book bags. And so I had to clean it out. And I've cleaned out my, I had cleaned out my car before, but it just ne could never stay clean. So here was my strategy. And I, I'm saying this because this is what you do in your house. And so we cleaned out the car. Everybody had to clean it up. And then every time I would get out of the car, I would turn around and look at it. If there was a stray paper, I'd take it out. If there was some trash in the car, I'd take it out. If there was something on the floor, a book bag, whatever, I'd take it out and bring it in the house. So my car was always pristine because I looked at it. It was just that simple. Once you get your first room cleaned up, your habits are going to make you throw something on a table, put something on the chair, because you have the habit of leaving your shoes in the middle of the floor, whatever your habits are that make the room messy in the first place, your habits are going to make it messed up again. So that room needs to be your primary focus. I even have this little thing that I made on a paper that it's called guard it like a bulldog, especially from yourself. So when you see that you left something in the wrong place, move it. Because your goal, your primary goal needs to be, once you get one room cleaned up, to never let it get messy again. Now, once that's a habit, then you can move to the next room. You clean that room up. Now you have two rooms. You can never let it get messed up again. But the rest of the house is still fair game. Now you have just two rooms. Then you move to the third room. Now you have three cleaned up rooms. And if you do that room by room by room, your house will be fine because you will have developed the habit of looking at it because we don't look at it. We have clutter blindness like the blue box in my living room. Yeah, that's right. So in my own experience, Poe, like we have done just one room, uh, but it's my family room. And it's interesting that you say all this, like, I'm going to be pay more attention to keeping that room clean, but it has become so much easier to keep that room clean because we got my kids used to keep all their games and books and all this stuff that didn't belong there. And so we were able to put that in different places and mostly in like a closet that I got shelving put in to organize their games. And uh, now when they want a game, they go to the closet, they pick one out. There's just that one game out. 
And when it's away, like we have a place for the blankets, the sofa. I mean, it, it's very easy to get that room organized now because there's not that much stuff in it anymore. And everything that's in it has a place to go. And so I love what you're saying. I'm going to make sure because it's so easy, I'm going to make sure that room stays organized until we go on to the next room because it does. Every time I walk into that room, it sort of gives me this feeling of calm and peace. I just look in that room. I don't look at the kitchen, which is adjacent to it, or the <laughs> living room, which is adjacent to it. I just kind of look in the corner of that room and I'm like, ah. That's right. You start with one area of sanity. So I got a question regarding kids. So like me, I'll do the dishes and just like what we're talking about, I love it when there's no dishes, right? So every time I see a dish in there, I'm like, whose dish is this? You know, I'll, ask, I'll ask the group, like, I have daughters, I have four daughters. We you know, I just got done cleaning the dishes. So how, what kind of tools or tactics that we can use that kids can get the, our kids to participate in this? Because right now, you know, they don't really, I got teens, so they're kind of like, Teenagers, uh, you know what I mean? They're they're not the most cleanliness, you know. So you're always, I'm always feeling like we're having to, but we try to do a good, you know, job telling them, hey, you got to clean up after yourself. You got to wash your dish after. Put it at least put it in the dishwasher. I always have people who want me to tell them how do I make my kids be organized, and I don't want my kids to end up like me. Blah 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 blah. Okay. But here's the thing: kids are going to do what you do. You're setting the yeah. example. If you're going to be messy, your kids are going to be messy. If you keep everything clean and neat, they're not going to be as good. They're going to lean towards that. And even if they're terrible because teenagers have to rebel, you know, part of life, when they get their own place, they're going to, you'll see that it's right. stuck. So they may not do it to, for you, but they probably will do it on their own. But they're going to do what you did. So the best thing you can do is have a system, have a routine. Here's, we do the dishes. And so we do the dishes and we do the dish. You know what I mean? So they'll learn that's what we do. Some people do drastic things like, you know, kid number one has the red plate glass and saucers or we, we take something and we write their initials on it. And you can do that, you know, but if you don't want that, which I didn't want that. Another strategy for older kids is ask them, what can I do so that you will keep the kitchen clean? You will be surprised what they'll tell you. They'll probably tell you the answer that will work for them. Yeah. Now, they may not tell you because they may not think you really yeah, want to hear it. I will. Or they may not tell you because they don't want you to do it. They may tell you how you can make the uh, other one be better. Yeah, you know right, what I mean? They, right. You know, it, it depends. Everybody has their own personality. I remember I, when, when my kids were little and they would fight and I would say, I don't know what to do about this. What should the punishment be for this? And they would think about it and they would come up with a rational, logical penalty. You should take my Game Boy and not let me use it for, for four days. I mean, they would really come up with good. Wow. And so I would depend on that. And I've learned that if you're fair with them, they'll be fair with you generally, or at least that was my experience. So try it. I mean, listen. The worst thing that will happen is they won't do it. But generally, yeah, you know, exactly. you're the lead in that. And they're going to follow what you do. And it depends on how old they are. You know, once they get, and when they're 14, they're going to be awful. But once they get, yeah, they, I mean, that's just reality. But when they're, when they're 16, they pretty much are grownups in terms of what they're going to do. But you're a little younger than that. They're going to do whatever you do. Good luck. Teenaging, raising teenagers is tough. So, Marsha, you and I met at my prior workplace, I was uh, running lifestyle medicine groups, having consultations. You live in Florida. I live in California. I do still see patients in Florida. And it was the step on your, your health journey, I would say. Like you've been on a kind of parallel health journey along this whole way. And so I'm curious if you might reflect on that, your health journey, and sort of how it has tied into your professional journey and also how you think about your healthy lifestyle now and the, the kind of systems you, you put into place for that and how they parallel what you do for organization. I was lucky because my, my blood pressure has always been too high. And it's because I have always suppressed what I think I want to say. Well, not always. 
when I was young, I never suppressed anything I wanted to say. I said anything. I thought of it, it went out. You know, my cousin used to call me a verbal ninja, and that was not a compliment. <laughs> but I learned that I needed to learn how to be tactful. And my mother used to say that you are not tactful. So I was trying, you know, in my late 20s when my kids were little and stuff, I was trying to learn how to be tactful. But to me, that meant don't say what you think, suppress it. And to the degree that I started suppressing what I thought was the degree that it mm. internally made my blood pressure high. Mm. So I would get furious, but you would never see it. I could hate somebody, they would never guess. I still have friends I don't like. I shouldn't say that out loud. But <laughs> I learned how to have this, <laughs> you know, this composed outer image. And inside I'm boiling, you know, I'm furious. I want to bite somebody's head off which I used to be very good at. I started losing my skill. <laughs> and honestly, being tactful and learning to be nice and suppressing what I really think <laughs> helped me in my business. So it you know, helped me make money. It wasn't a bad thing, but it caught up with me. But during my journey, at one point in my life was a raw vegan. And that was very helpful because it helped me to get my health back at that point in my life. And then... I fell off the wagon and went all the way back to not doing what I knew to do. So by the time I met you, I had had a health scare based on my blood pressure being too high. But I started reading. I started reading books by Dr. Furman and Dr. McDougall and Dr. Esselton and T. Colin Caldwell. Caldwell Esselstyn, T. Yes. Colin Campbell. T. Colin Campbell, yeah. And um, the, the doctor who runs the, um, oh my goodness. Pop Dean Orange. Dean Ornish, all those people. I started reading their books. So I thought, okay, I need, what I need is lifestyle medicine, not another doctor who wants to just give me some more pills and then keep raising the pill. Like they give you pills, 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 pills until you get so sick, then they send you home to die. That's the mm -hmm. plan. It's almost like you have a counter on your head, you know? Okay, you have to spend X amount of dollars in prescription drugs and then they can send you home to die. So they want to squeeze all the money out of you first. And, and so, okay. I knew that and I was very cynical about the whole as you know, with the whole medical system and doctors and all that. And I met you and you were like an absolute breath of fresh air. Mm. You listened. Most doctors don't listen. They don't. They walk in the room. They tell you what they're going to do. I, I saw another doctor just Monday who said, same thing. He walked in the room, didn't listen to anything I said. He said, okay, I'm going to change your medicine and I'm going to increase your dosage. And then he walked out like, no, first of all, because I have an ace in the hole, you, <laughs> you know, I didn't say that. I didn't say anything, but it's like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do. I'm doing all the things you told me to do, which are, by the way, the same things that Dr. Esselton, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Berman, it's the same thing. Your lifestyle determines if you're going to be healthy or not, not the pills you take. Hmm. And I think Everybody sort of knows it, or at least people who will read a book know that, but they just don't know where to go and they don't know how to get help. And so I was absolutely looking and I am of the fundamental philosophy that what you're looking for is also looking for you. Mm. And I found you and I thought you were just the most wonderful person oh. ever. And then they said your your practice was gonna close. Oh, oh, I was devastated. Like, oh my God, you know, like it took me a lifetime to find you. I think it was like a month or maybe a month after you joined. Yeah. Yeah. Then I said, Hey, I need to get my house organized. It is a disaster. It's something I've wanted to do. I was working with a professional organizer before the pandemic. It was an investment, as I like to say. And so she would come for these long sessions. We would clear stuff. We would organize. We did a few sessions, right? So we got part of the house organized. In fact, there, the semblance of that is still like those areas are more clutter free and, and better organized. But they've lost. I mean, let's be honest. The pandemic wasn't a friend to home organization for most people, for most people. So I said, well, I'm going to propose a, a barter system. <laughs> you need a lifestyle doctor. I need a professional organizer. 
It was a match made in heaven. It was a match made in heaven. Really. So I am I am thrilled with that because can I brag about you for a moment then? Oh, so like when I me. met you, your blood pressure, your top number, your systolic blood pressure was like in the 170s, 180s quite regularly in your at your home cuff. When you go to the doctor, it was even higher sometimes when you go to the doctor, which happens to a lot of people. They get very anxious and, and scared when they're in that situation and their blood pressure can go up. And simple things. I mean, you were already working on your changing your diet. You're not eating raw vegan, but you're eating whole food plant-based. And we talked about movement and you're doing some regular movement and we're, we're working continually to optimize that. And some down regulations, some slow nasal breathing and a particular smoothie recipe that I um, put together that has a lot of you know, flaxseed, for example, it's evidence-based. Four tablespoons of flaxseed will lower the blood pressure. It was studied head-to-head, -head, randomized against a blood pressure pill. And it did just as well and had, especially in people with high blood pressure, like you were starting with, it had quite a significant impact. So you've been doing all those things and now getting readings sometimes in the 110s, 120s, 130s very consistently for the last how many it's a few weeks month or two oh and we've come down on your medicine that's the <laughs> the the cherry on top is we've we've reduced your medicine too so you're on very small doses of medication now and so i didn't do that work right it's just like what you say for the people who you help organize like this can't wouldn't it be great i mean this is the promise of pills right oh i just have to take this pill and it'll take the problem away but as you said, somebody else can't do that work for you. In fact, if somebody else does that work for you, you're not addressing the roots. And you've addressed the roots in a very profound way. You know, the progress and the results are showing. So for me, it's so gratifying to be able to work with you and to see that. You know, I was prepared to do the work. I just needed the support and I could never get the support in the allopathic medical community. So I'm so happy to find you. And I, I still can't find the support locally. You know, we talked about it. I need to find a cardiologist. Like they all say the same thing. Change your medicine, increase the dosage. I'm so, so, so happy. And it's the same thing with your organizing. Like I can't fly to California and do it for you. Well, I mean, it could, but that would be impractical. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not a good idea. We've had one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, but I attended your class. And in the class, I said, I want to get my office, my like, recording space organized. And I had all these books everywhere. And so here we are. It's actually doing pretty well, you know, now a few weeks later. So I'm excited to get back to it. Good. I'm glad because um, everybody thinks they're worse than they are at a point and then they think they're better than they are. I, I don't I don't understand. I don't know that point. That's true. But I find that like people who whose house whose homes and offices and boats and cars and everything that we've done, it's really not that bad. On a spectrum. They know, but if it's that bad to you, then it's that bad. Hmm. But when I was new as an organizer, I teamed up with another organizer and we did a messy desk contest. And we went to this guy. This guy said, well, you know, I have, I have a few things laying around, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you couldn't get in his house. He was the best advertisement. We took lots of pictures. I think I made more money off that guy because we did. He had the before and then he had the after. I thought it was so <laughs> bad before. And then the after we were able to, you know, make it look neat and everything. But he said, ah, you know, it's, he, he thought it was funny. He didn't even take it serious. And I was always amazed, like, I'd go to somebody's house and they had five sheets of paper and they were in desperation. Oh, can you see? I've been struggling. And then you go the next day, you go to somebody's house and they have 5,000 pieces of paper and they're like, you know, I just got to put these things away. <laughs> it's no bearing on the fact of how much it is. <laughs> it's always about perception. I'm totally um, mesmerized by your story and your work. Poe and I often have guests on uh, where we you know, sort of as we're having the conversation, it's like very clear 
that they have found their purpose in life. They have found, as uh, our friend who's been a guest on the podcast, Melinda Joyner, says, they're more. They're more in life. And you clearly found your more is this organization. And you said it like the first person you visited, that woman who had hoarding, who you visited, and you walked in the and you started crying, and then you spent the day with her, and then you sort of realized you are a vessel to serve the world in this way. And I was hoping you could reflect on that a little bit more, like sort of how this has created a sense of meaning and purpose in your life, and also where you are now and where you're going. Well, it makes me feel good when I'm able to help somebody. I can remember there were times when I would help somebody, like their house was like literally a disaster when I walked in, stuff everywhere, laying all around everything. And then when I left, the house would look so good. And I would say, let me just walk back through one more time, just because it made me feel good. Because it made me feel good, because it made them feel good. And so, it was just an up day. Plus, it also had the benefit of me being able to leave my life at the front door and go into their life. And I can leave, like, leave all my troubles behind and I didn't have to think about it again until I got back in my car, you know. <laughs> so it was just a feel good day. And I just made it my life's work to make somebody else feel good. And I think that we're missing that right now in our society. Like, if we just make other people feel good, we'll feel good. Everything is, you know, I, I have a friend who tends to be very negative. And I call her because she's very, she always has stuff to talk about. She's very knowledgeable about food and health. But she's always got a problem. So I tell her, no, I can't do, I don't do problems anymore. No, I don't want to hear any more negativity. You're my friend. I need to feel good. What's good about today? So she's starting to get it, you know? She's starting and then when she makes, when she says something that makes me feel good, I feel good. Then I say something that makes her feel good. It's like, we keep going up, you know, instead of, it's always negative. So we keep going. I do not listen to the news. I don't know what's going on in the world. I don't care. It doesn't affect, I don't, it, does, it doesn't matter. I can't fix it. I can't help anyone, you know, unless they're like on my street, but that's not going to happen. So we have to find a way in life to feel good. And most people haven't figured out how to feel good. Just feel good. I remember when I heard about paying it forward, you know, you drive through a toll and you say, I'm going to pay for the person behind next to me, or I'm going to round up this person's groceries behind me. Or that kind of stuff. You feel wonderful when you do that. We need to, everybody needs to just give a little bit of positivity back in the world. But if you don't have any, find something for that person. Make them feel good. You can't make you feel good. You can make them feel good. And guess what will happen? I have a t-shirt that says, make kindness a habit. I guess if I had one, one mantra or one thing to say to the world, I think that'd probably be it. Make kindness a habit. Just be nice. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be a jerk. Be nice to somebody today. And especially somebody who can't do anything for you. You know, you can go be nice to your neighbors and stuff, but be nice to this guy on the corner that you've never seen before who can't get, do anything for you. So I have learned that, you know, to the degree that I'm good to people is the degree that I feel good. And I think that's why I was fortunate to meet you and, and fall, find the lifestyle medicine thing because I feel like what you put in the universe is there for you and you can get, and it, it comes back to you. Mm. So mm. I feel like that. So I keep doing it. Oh, it I feel very fortunate to have found you. And Marcia Poe and I talk about this, but like I very, in, not infrequently become friends with my <laughs> patients because <laughs> when you listen deeply and you get to know their, how incredible and amazing they are, you know, it's like, oh, I want to spend more time with this person. I want to learn from this person. I want this person in my life. And there's something really beautiful about that. Okay. Well, you kind of answered it, but I'm going to ask it anywhere. Poe, do you want to ask it? We ask it like one final question. So usually, you know, our, our show is called the, the health feast. And we usually ask all our guests, if you were to come to a feast, you know, with us, 
figuratively, you know, would you be, what would you be bringing to the party? What would you be bringing to the feast? And that usually can be, you know, some type of life lesson. You kind of shared it a little bit, but if you wanted to add to that, you know, what kind of thoughts would you want to bring to the feast to share with others? I think it's important to share yourself. We are all such magnificent beings and we close ourselves off and we feel like we're not. And I would just want to share me, you know, like meet new people, answer whatever questions people have that I have the answers to, which is probably not that much. You know, I feel like I have a teaspoon full of information, but I want to give it to everybody. And if we all do that, we're all good. We'll all be good. And I think that I have figured out how to maneuver the world in a gentle, graceful, peaceful way for myself. And I would like to share that because I think we can all have that. It's not that hard. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. And it just is about doing the right thing. And we can all do that. It's not magic. So that's what I would do. I hope that answered your question. That's perfect. Well said. Yeah, I just want to thank you for your time and uh, thank you for being here in the space with us to share your, your teaspoon of, of kindness. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we get more people that will listen. And also, I mean, I love all the, you know, all the information and all the little advice and little nuggets of information that we can utilize in our daily life to make it a little bit healthier. But so thank you very much, Marsha. Well, thank you both. This was fantastic. Marsha, Marsha, if people want to uh, work with you, if they want to join your virtual organizing group or they want to learn more about, how many books have you written? Oh, they're right here, actually. I brought them. Yeah. I, thought, I thought I should have a prop. Yeah. Okay, so here they are. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, if we were going to start, if you were going to recommend people to start, with one, is it dependent on the situation they're in, or like, let's say for like the really messy, cluttered person who wants to kind of get a semblance of organization on their life? Really messy, I would go with five days to a clutter free house, hmm. which is also on this, but I think these are obsolete now. But if it's not, CD, it's, it's probably available on Audible or audiobook, I'm guessing. Oh, it's definitely available on them. Yeah. Did you um, narrate the book or did they use a professional? They used a professional. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just curious. Just curious. And then this is our very first book. Well, actually, no, that's not true. This is our first book in English in America. This is our very first book. It's in Germany and German. But wow. then it turned into this in America. And this is actually at the public and within the public library system. We won an award. I would say go to the library and get this hmm. and learn all you can. Don't start by buying it. And then if you like it and you want to keep it in your library, buy it, which is a tip I give people. Don't just buy every mm. book you think you yeah. want. Get so it from the library. Read it. <laughs> right? right. Get it from the library. Read it. And if you love it and you want it to be a part of your world, then buy it. But don't just start out buying it. And then we also wrote so true. Smart office organizing. And we wrote 10 time management choices that can change your life. And then they kept rewriting, doing it because they liked it. So that's another good one. 10 time management choices. Okay. And who is Sandra Felton is your co-author? Sandra Felton and I are co-authors together. We, we jointly wrote the books. I get Her it. name is first because F comes before S. <laughs> and she, <laughs> she was around before me. She started organizing. That's cool maybe eight or nine years before me, but she was a teacher and an author. And I was actually running around going into people's homes oh, and wow. offices and stuff doing it. So she told me for years, Marcia, you need to write a book. You have a good system. You have a good methodology. You need to write a book. And I said, Sandra, I don't have time to write a book. I have three kids. I have to work. I'm going to see clients all day. And then when I get home, I have to, you know, I don't have time to write a book. So Sandra said, well, I'll write your book for you. That was how she, she wrote me in. And then that was not what she did. She was the consummate teacher. She would say, okay, Marsha, if we were going to talk about blah, 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 what would you say? <laughs> and so 
we ended up doing the book too. So the first book, she kind of led me. The words are mine, the stories are mine, but you know, she just kind of pulled it together. And I'm grateful for that. And then after that, the rest of them, she went, we, we literally wrote together. Okay. So if listeners want to check out one of your books from the library and they love it, they'll buy it. Where can they find you, your website, if they want to work with you directly or? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Okay. My website is sortitout.net. And I used to say, we like to think of it as a safety net. Because if you go to sortedout.com, you will not find me. I can't get that. Actually, my phone number is on everything. Like everything I, I, also, I have a YouTube channel. I don't have a lot of videos on YouTube. I think I have 11. But, you know, my number is on that. So anybody okay. can reach out to me. Uh, well, I will link all of that in our notes for the episode. Yeah. And, uh... and I really don't mind, you know, people can call me. I'm not like trying to hide. <laughs> I will talk to That's anyone. Enough. So if you want to put my phone number, when you put it, just, you can put my information in my phone number. Okay. Sweet. And um, yeah, I have three programs that are online, that are automated, that you just sign up and every month you get a module. And then I have a, the, every Friday boot camp. Friday is at 1.30 Eastern. That's right. So. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, this was just super generous of you with your time and so informative and i just feel so lucky that uh the universe connected us because you found my medical practice and we started working together because the gifts i'm getting from this relationship just keep revealing themselves so yeah I'm super it's, thankful for you coming on today it's it's absolutely mutual and i'm grateful as well and paul it was a Pleasure to meet you. Awesome meeting you, Marsha. Thank you so much for today. Yeah, it was. Yeah, you might be hearing from me too. I think I might try to figure out a way to connect myself and some of my relatives to you as well. Awesome. So, a absolutely. Yeah. You know, working with people is just, <clears throat> excuse me, wow, I did good until right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love when people call me. I love that it, because it, to me, it's a gift because they're calling me to ask me about something that I know all the answers to. I mean, how, how fortunate are we, you know? Mm. And I don't get stumped, I love it, I get to help people, mm. I get to feel good, mm. they get to feel good. Yeah. Mm. So I tell people, just call me, you know? Mm. Yeah, you might be getting a call from either myself <laughs> or somebody in my, in my family might be giving you a holler here in a few, in a few days or so. Absolutely, call yeah. me. Before this weekend, I know we're not, the times aren't going to be on here, but just for you, because I'm going out of the country for two weeks. Oh, wow. So I won't be answering any phone calls. Okay. Okay. So call me okay. before Sunday or in two weeks. Okay. All right. Well, you have a great vacation. Have yes. a good time. Thank yeah. you. All right. Well, you take right. care, Marsha. And everyone, thank you again for listening. And uh, if you have any questions or comments for me and Poe, you can visit our website, thehealthbeast.com. And uh, sign up for our newsletter as well. And we will get you back here next time at the uh, next episode of The Health Piece. Take care, everyone. Bye. All right, everybody.